Hi, veggie lover. All right, so you are listening to a replay today because we are doing a countdown of the top five most downloaded episodes of Veggie Doctor Radio. And today we're airing number two, which means that there's only two weeks left of 2022 before we ring in that new year, shiny, beautiful new year, 2023. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. So this is episode number 193, and it first aired on February 6th of 2022. It's entitled, How Being Selfish Can Transform Your Heart Health with Dr. Columbus Batiste. Heart health is so important. Heart disease, cardiovascular disease is our number one chronic disease and the number one cause of death for Americans. So this is very important to hear this information, but also Dr. Batiste is such a dynamic speaker. He's so passionate. He's such a great person. And he has this wonderful mnemonic that he's come up with that makes it simple to remember the things that you should do that helps you take care of yourself. So especially now that we're going into the new year and people are thinking about new year's resolutions or goals or vision boards, all the stuff that I love to do, What are you going to put on your list for yourself this year? How are you going to take care of yourself? So this is a great episode to refresh yourself on if you have listened to it before. If not, definitely listen to it and definitely share with your friends and family because this is applicable to everybody. Okay, the number two most downloaded episode of Veggie Doctor Radio is episode number 193, How Being Selfish can transform your heart health with Dr. Columbus Batiste. Thank you so much for being here and enjoy. Welcome back veggie lovers for another awesome episode of Veggie Doctor Radio today with Dr. Columbus Batiste, who is a board certified interventional cardiologist. I'm not even going to say too much. I'm going to give you his intro, but you just have to listen to this episode. I cannot wait to share it with you. But first, please remember that the information on this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to replace careful evaluation and treatment. So if you have concerns about yourself, anybody in your family, please consult a health professional. Dr. Columbus D. Batiste is a board certified interventional cardiologist. Through research, he discovered the disease modifying benefits from a whole food plant based diet, stress reduction, and exercise. As a result, he has co founded the nonprofit organization Healthy Heart Nation, a 501c3, which targets health, education, business, and legal disparities. He has also taken on the mantle of educating communities of color through the Slave Food Project, which explores the relationship between stress, the weaponization of food, and health disparities in communities of color. This is really such a powerful episode. Thank you for joining today, and let's have it. Dr. Columbus Batiste, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. What a pleasure to have you on today. Well, thank you so much for having me on. This is my honor. It's privilege to be here with you. You've done such tremendous work. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Awesome. Yes, I have seen you do great work over the years, and I'm so glad that I finally got you on the show. I'm so interested to hear about your unique perspective and contribution to healthcare and to wellness, but let's 
set the foundation and start from the beginning. Tell me about your plant-based journey. How did you discover it? How did you get to where you are today? Oh, wow. You know, that was a long uh, process in and of itself. It really actually began early on. I mean, so the crazy part was that my parents were into health and wellness. My dad actually owned a health food store. Cool. Uh, before, you know, back in the 70s. Yes, back in the 70s. I'm giving my age. And so <laughs> the, they had to close it down when my mom had me. I was what you call the pleasant surprise. So my eldest brother is 16 years older than I am. And uh, so I've always had some form of eating healthfully. But when I would say that the, the spark, that fork in the road, the transition really came was around the time that my dad's um, illness really kind of took over. And towards the end of his life, by this point, I was a board certified practicing interventional cardiologist. And as I watched him just wither away in front of me, you know, I was left with a void of, man, what else is there that could have been done that what I didn't do? And that really started the whole ball rolling in the process of, of looking the combination with my dad, the combination with my patients asking me, doc, what should I eat? Mm -hmm. And that exploration began. Barnes and Nobles. <laughs> then to the early findings of, of YouTube and online and then to research and, and uh, landed here with Plant Based World and, and found it in ir irrefutable evidence regarding the power and the benefit of lifestyle. So cool. So you already had a gift of being interested in wellness and health from a young age. What was your diet like growing up? Well, I can't actually admit that I had an interest in wellness <laughs> at a young age. Although they had the, the health food store and vitamins and so forth, I still love, I was a sugarholic. I'm a recovering sugar holic, and so <laughs> I was what you would call a junk food foodetarian. I may I love not eat meat, but I ate tons of junk food, and uh, and so that that whole transition was really unearthing the fact that it's not about labels; it's about the quality of food that you that you eat on any given day, and that's what really kind of really laid the foundation of of change for me. Mm -hmm. And what inspired you to go into cardiology specifically? Oh, I'll tell you, you know, I didn't want, I, my dad kind of gave me three options. He said, listen, you're going to either be a doctor, a lawyer, or a business person, you know? <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not much. And from the school of education, education, education. And so I love the body and I wanted to be the Lakers team doctor. I grew up in LA, grew up in the inner city there. I Magic Johnson. I was like, I want to be the Lakers team doctor in my second year of college. I did an, an externship, a rotation at the University of Virginia, and I interacted with this African-American female cardiologist and fell in love with the field of cardiology. And, and it just seemed as if everything was meant to be because then as I took physiology, everything made sense. It was just like we, we communicate in the same language, this love language of the heart and me just kind of gelled together and it made sense. And I've been in love with the heart ever since. I love how you put that, the love language of the heart. It's symbolic in so many different ways. That's so beautiful. So yes. you go to medical school, you go to residency fellowship, you're training forever, okay? Yes. <laughs> so thank you <laughs> for, for doing the work that you do because I know it takes so long to get there. By the time you're a practicing interventional cardiologist, are you still a junk fooditarian? Or at what point were you like, ah, I need to start eating a little bit differently here you know what i i honestly i was i was you know i mean you know how it is inside of training you're brought in this food by the drug reps you're staying up all hours you don't get sleep you don't have time for exercise um you're eating late at night and you're eating you're craving salt sugar and fat mm -hmm. and that stays with you then you enter practice as you're growing your practice you're you're on the go and you're, you're doing what you do. And so that wasn't, that's what I knew in life. And yes, of course, I work out. Yes, of course, I'd have the ebb and flow uh, for, for different life events, a wedding or an event that I want to get in better shape and so forth. I might cut back on a few things, but there was no consistent intent or purpose behind it and true mm -hmm. legitimate purpose behind my efforts at that time. Yeah. So you started the reading, you discover, you learn more about plant-based nutrition. And at that point, 
Did you yourself start changing your diet first before you started introducing it to your patients or how did that work out? Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, so my dad suffered with diabetes and, you know, I've told this story many a times about how my dad was into his appearance. He was into language. He was into business. He was into his appearance and dressing well and dressing for success. And so he loved to get dressed up, dressed up. But unfortunately, as the ill effects of diabetes, and many of your listeners may resonate with them, that you it affects your whole entire body yeah. and your nerves as well. And so he had tremendous neuropathy. Mm. And that neuropathy led to what's called a foot drop. So he had to wear braces to insert and save in his shoes. So I decided I'm a big time cardiologist. I'm going to buy my dad these fancy shoes that he loves that he used to wear when he would get dressed up that he could insert the boots in and or his brace rather. And so I bought those shoes. It led to him developing a, 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 a sore, mm. which then became an ulcer, which then led to him no longer being able to walk and then led to his demise. And so that was a tremendous burden on me for feeling mm. as if I precipitated that. And as I looked at things and looked at my role and my lack of role in really transitioning and transforming his course with diabetes. And as I read and I researched, I realized that the power was in front of us the whole time. It was right underneath our nose in terms of the food. And so I began to adopt that, that change myself. I started to go and just eat more healthfully and eat the foods because I was already there. I already wasn't eating uh, 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 cheese and, and meats and so forth. And I began to transition completely towards um, foods of the earth, foods rich in fiber, foods that have been shown and demonstrated to be powerful in chronic disease management. And as I did that, one story I always like to tell, because fortunately I had no awareness of any chronic disease with myself, but I let my life insurance lapse just because I wasn't paying attention amidst everything that was happening with my dad. And so when I, at the time I had to re-up my life insurance, and this is probably about five years after I had gotten the original um, uh, estimates, actuary, I redid it and I was telling my financial planner, I was like, oh man, let, let me work out a little bit more. I did this, but let me do it more. And she said, Columbus, do you realize that you went from marginally preferred to super preferred and you're five years older? And she was like, nobody does this. And I'll tell you, even at the time, it didn't really click the fact that I had made this transition with my nutrition. But afterwards, I reflected and I'm like, that's the only difference <laughs> that the five years made was that my my transition towards eating a whole food plant based diet is really what what that the the actuaries actually said, you know what, <laughs> this guy <laughs> has a better chance of living longer now than he did five years ago. And that's the power of plants. That's amazing. I had no clue that that's what you're called whenever you're less likely to die, super preferred. <laughs> but <laughs> makes sense, right? We're happier to take your money because we won't have to give it back to you. That's, that's a, a better for us. Well, that is so cool. Well, tell me now that you've been through that experience and, you know, what a heavy burden on your heart. So, you know, my, I, I go out to you, my heart goes out to you for what you had to go through with your father. But I feel like I've heard some similar stories like this. It's very personal. You know, whenever it becomes a personal, a family thing, people really take it to heart. They really start taking steps for themselves, but then they're able to help other people. So tell me how you apply it to your patient population. Well, I mean, I jumped in immediately. Well, let me take a step back. You understand as being a physician that physicians can be tough on one another. We fall back on what's the evidence, what's the standard of care. And so if I'm truthful, being a physician of African descent, a physician of color, uh, there was a part of me that began to worry about not being seen as a quack yeah. and that I had to do everything possible to make sure I was like at the top of my game. I had understanding of all the literature. I had, I, everything was evidence-based. And so I was really torn going down this road of saying, how do I as an interventional cardiologist start to introduce this into my patients? And I'll be honest, as I began to reflect on my, my dad's life and the fact that the power of one that had one doc encouraged my dad, it might have been different. Had I been that power of one, that it would have been a huge difference that would have been a domino effect inside of a family and subsequent community. And I knew I had no choice but to start. I didn't have an elevator pitch or anything of that sort. I just wrote down a few books that I knew and encouraged them. 
And I'll tell you, it was meant to be. I believe it was in the divine plan because these first three patients that I did this for, nothing even detailed. I didn't write out what to do or anything. They came back and, and they told me, Doc, I feel better. Wow. Doc, all of a sudden my angina has gone away, that chest discomfort, that tightness, my breathing is improved. I did what you said. And I knew in that moment that there was power in the influence of giving a recommendation, that there was a power in the knowledge and in the constituency of nutrition. And that's really what was the springboard in my journey towards educating patients and really saying, I need to do more. I need to do more. I need to do more. <laughs> that's so amazing. It's like you got validation. You got positive reinforcement from the universe telling you, yes, this is the direction. Keep going in this direction. That's awesome. Well, a lot of people are in, they're, they're fully immersed in the standard American diet. They grew up this way. That's what we're surrounded with. That's the kind of lifestyle we live. It's hard almost to escape it, but there's many that realize that they need to start taking steps away from it. What do you think is the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to making specific dietary changes that decrease our risk of heart disease or once you've had heart disease, recurrent issues with your heart? Yeah, I, I, I think the biggest thing, the biggest bang for the buck is to really focus on what you're doing for your health as opposed to what you're not doing, right? I, mm -hmm. I, you know, we focus so much on the negative aspect. I don't eat this. I don't go there. I don't smoke this. What do you do for your health? What do you do for your heart? And so ultimately for a patient who's uncertain that they're on this kind of, they're, they're, they're straddling the fence over how to approach it, I start simply by telling them, let's just add to your diet. Maybe let's commit to one thing, something small, something measurable, something easily attainable that's relevant to you. Maybe it's like trying berries. No, we don't just say try fruit. It's like, well, what kind of fruit are you willing to eat? Mm -hmm. What kind of fruit do you like? Have you already grown accustomed to? Okay, well, how much, how accessible is that fruit? Okay, well, well, how can you, when can you eat it? <laughs> you know, and we begin this process, whether it's green leafy vegetables, which is my biggest bang for the buck, I always start there. And that could be simply for someone, it could just be romaine lettuce. And then we transition to spinach. Then we transition to kale and Swiss chard and dandelions and the bitter greens and begin that process of evolution. Mm -hmm. But it has to start with that first bite, that first sip of something health promoting to begin that process and that journey towards a, a health filled life. Dr. Batiste, that's so empowering. And I love how you take that coach mindset. You're already referring to SMART goals to helping somebody set a goal that is attainable, that they feel that they can achieve and measurable. That's so important, but small enough that it's not overwhelming. I love that. That's just so perfect. And I think a lot of physicians, they're not aware of that coach mindset of that way that we can help empower patients to start where they are and in a positive way, start making changes to their lifestyle instead of telling them all the things that they're doing wrong and they need to stop immediately, <laughs> right? Which is what we typically do as doctors. Absolutely. And you know, I mean, all of us, we walk around and we all have negative thoughts sitting inside of our head. Oh, I didn't do this right. Oh, I didn't look, uh, you know, listen, what, what happened as I'm walking up to my office, I said, oh man, how could you be late to this interview? How, you know, how, how, why didn't you wake your son up earlier to take him to school? Why didn't you do this? These negative thoughts, they percolate in all of us on a consistent basis, mm -hmm. what we could have done different. So now when you add to this negativity with external feeding of the negativity, right? We wonder why there's a mental health crisis in America. Yes. We wonder why people are struggling amidst the other stressors of life and the negative feedback they receive from the media and from surrounding uh, institutions in this relationship between stress and disease is so pronounced between mental health and disease. And so, yes, we have to approach our patients in a way in which um, we're honest with them, that we're intentional with them. <laughs> that we're letting them know what the consequences are of their actions, but we're also encouraging them to let them know that, yes, it is possible. Yes, you can. You too can have the right towards a healthful life. You too have the right to be better than you are right now. And that's the goal for all of us. Mm. I love that. We're a supporter. We're a teammate. We're a guide. We're right alongside them 
helping them on yes. this journey. And you're so right. Right now I'm reading the book, The Fifth Agreement. I recently mm -hmm. talked on my podcast about the four agreements, which I think is a wonderful mm -hmm. book. And then one of my best friends was like, there's another one. There's a fifth agreement now. <laughs> so, okay. but it's so true that our, the voices inside our head, we're our own worst critics. We can be so vicious to ourselves with what we tell ourselves. And just like you said, then we add on to it what society, what the world, what our healthcare providers, what our parents, what you know, people tell us. And, and then we're just full of negativity. Sometimes it becomes paralyzing. Then it's hard to make changes whenever we're stuck in that negative mindset. Well, one of the things that I, one of the questions I get a lot is from people that are already plant-based. So they've made this big change. They're feeling better. They have all these benefits, right? They feel great. Their skin is glowing. They have all this energy and they're just like, yay, I've achieved it. But then they realize their cholesterol is still high or it's even more elevated. So one of the questions I got from my listeners and my followers is what are some other causes of elevated cholesterol? And at what point do people need to be concerned that they may need to go on medication or do other interventions besides just diet and lifestyle? Yes, thank you for asking that question. You know, I think many times inside the lifestyle world, we, we, um, we put a scarlet letter on anyone who perhaps has to take uh, medications or have procedures. And I believe that that's grossly unfair and it's an injustice, injustice. When you look at this interplay between, between medicine and lifestyle, oftentimes it's perceived as if it is indeed, it's a, it's, I failed somehow mm -hmm. that somehow I didn't do something right. And that's not the case. So taking cholesterol, for instance, we understand that your body produces cholesterol. Cholesterol actually is a part of the body that you need this for the function of your, of your nerves and your body system and so forth. But the issue is as it relates to, uh, 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 the source of the fat, the source of the cholesterol, which oftentimes there's a dietary source. And it's the animal source that can be so harmful. So when I talk to individuals whose cholesterol and triglycerides are still high, I really start to try and tease out precisely what they're eating. Because vegan, although it's hugely beneficial for the environment, it's hugely beneficial for animal rights and suffering too as well. It does not always equate to health. And so there's many vegan products because I always boil things back down and, and refocus the attention of my patients and those who I'm speaking to. The real enemy dietary wise is the standard American diet. Mm -hmm. And it presents itself in many disguises as vegan, as keto, as paleo, as gluten free. And it's a highly processed, refined substances. They are high in salt, sugar, and fats. And so when we ingest still the standard American diet vegan style of burgers and pizzas and cookies and chips, uh, this ultra refined foods that yes, we oftentimes see our levels being high when we're still engaging in French fries and all these things that are cooked in hot boiling oils. It's no surprise that our cholesterol levels are still high. And so we have to really, I think the first step is really digging in and exploring what am I ingesting? What am I eating first? After that, the next level is to say, okay, I'm trying to determine, do I need medication or not? And so you're working with your provider to really go through your cholesterol profile in addition to your other risk factors. So it's heart health month, or at least it is inside of February. And we understand that blood pressure is a major issue inside the United States and inside many communities as well of specific, specific disparities in optimal treatment. And so what's your blood pressure level? What's your triglycerides? What's your weight? You know, what's your, uh, do you smoke? All these variables that play a role into developing what we call the atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk assessment, mm -hmm. your ASCVD score. And that gives you a sense of what's your estimated mortality or likelihood over the next 10 years of having a stroke, a heart attack, or heart failure. And if that, that level is above seven and a half a percent based on the calculations, that's where societies recommend the um, the statin therapy or some varying form of cholesterol lowering therapy but can it be achieved by aggressive nutrition and exercise and so forth yes it's been proven time and time again does that mean it's one size fit all for every single person absolutely not 
-hmm. We're all uniquely made. We're all individual. And so some of us will respond more favorably than others to our dietary lifestyle. And it doesn't mean it's still not beneficial because some will give it and throw throw in the towel and say, well, if I have to take medication anyway, I might as well keep eating whatever I want to eat. Well, that's not exactly true because here's the thing. Studies have shown that people going into the hospital, say roughly about 10 years old now, into UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, the Bruins, 75% of those being admitted with acute coronary syndrome or heart attacks have what we would characterize as normal cholesterol values. It's deeper. It's not just the cholesterol. That's just one earmark of, of, of like a fruit of an underlying burning inflammatory state. So your job is to lower the overall inflammatory state of your body. And that's the benefit of a whole food, fiber rich nutritional approach towards life. Oh yeah, that's perfect. And that was my next question because I know that there's a significant percentage of people that their cholesterol isn't actually technically elevated according to what our standards are, but they can still have atherosclerosis and progress to have myocardial infarction. So I think your point is perfect in that it's not just about boiling it down to just one thing that we're trying to improve because whenever we're eating healthier, we're moving our bodies, we're decreasing our stress, it's increasing and improving our overall well-being as well. And we just feel better. And really that's the point of life anyway, right? I mean, thank goodness we have the technology that we can look at these markers and we can study things so that we can help ourselves live longer through technology. But really that day-to-day way of checking in is how do you feel? Are you able to get down on the ground and play with your kids and your grandkids? Can you take your dog for a walk? Can you hang out with your friends and chat over dinner? You know, that's the way that we can check in. And it's not worth it just to change your diet because it's not making everything perfect in order to indulge in these momentary pleasures. You know, we've all been there with the processed food. There's that momentary pleasure. We want to just like rip into that box of cookies But then it leads to day after day not feeling good, you know? Yes, absolutely. I tell my folks all the time that, listen, there's only two goals, really two goals of any healthcare provider, of any practitioner. Help you feel better or live longer. Mm -hmm. Feel better, live longer. That's really basically it. That's our ultimate goal. And so what, what has become clearly evident is that adopting a healthful lifestyle, that, to be honest with you, goes even beyond just the food, but adopting a healthful lifestyle can definitely mentally strengthen you. It can help you feel better. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt from large scale studies, it can help you live longer. Mm -hmm. So there is a huge value in terms of taking the approach and the time to really looking at what we're eating, because you're right. We all have those moments. And what are they typically associated with? Stress, Mm -hmm. stress. It's what usually comes hand in hand with, with, with tearing open the box of cookies. And why is that? Because stress equals dessert spell backwards, right? And so what we do, we go and we, because it's going to release and give you a sort of antidepressant effect that all of a sudden by having these sugary substances and so forth, they're going to release a component of the serotonin and so forth, but it's very short lived. Because it's so ultra processed and it gets taken up and your blood sugar drops and plummets and because of the insulin that surge that that's there. And so you have this whole biochemical process mm. that begins that leaves you void, leaves you wanting more and more and you're unfilled. Yes. Because you think that the resource to offset the demands of life is in a food, it's in alcohol, it's in smoking. It's it's and it's not found in those things. That is not the source of the resource that you really need to offset the stressors of life or demands of life to decrease your overall stress burden. Exactly. Oh, you're so right. That dopamine pathway, that dopamine cycle, it just leaves you wanting. It leaves you so unsatisfied. You're never going to be able to feel better when that dopamine just keeps calling you over and over and over again. (laughs) It's going to keep going into those substances. But before we leave this topic, I just want to emphasize for the listeners what Dr. Batiste said that, yes, for the most part, when we 
eat a whole food plant-based diet, we can optimize things, we can improve things, we may be able to avoid medication, but some people may still need other interventions. And that is not, it should not be a source of shame because it's very complex, right? Dr. Batiste, there's so many different ways, places, there could be genetic defects that cause you to make too much cholesterol, absorb too much cholesterol, all these kinds of things. So there's all different things that can happen with people, just like Dr. Batiste said, it's very individualized. Keep doing the best you can. Tune into your body to how you're feeling. That should guide you to continue these healthy lifestyles. But don't neglect your health because you think that that's the only thing you can do. Hmm. Absolutely. All right. So, and then one other point about medications, because this is something I'm not clear on still. It goes back and forth, I feel, from different doctors. My understanding is that once you've had a heart attack and you have a stent in place, that there are certain medications you may have to take forever to decrease the risk of clotting. Is that true? Or are there some people that even if they have a stent in place that they may be able to go off medications? All right. So several things inside. That was a loaded question. So <laughs> after, sustain, after sustaining a heart attack, there it boils back down to like the concept I, I brought up before, which is which medications have been shown to help you live longer or feel better, right? And so I'll, I'll, I'll add to live longer, have uh, prevent a second heart attack. Mm-hmm. So what studies have shown is the fact that in individuals, and these studies are not partitioning out a person's lifestyle in terms of aggressive nutrition and everything else like that. So we we can't necessarily apply and know for sure what that means definitively based on the prior studies. But looking at those studies just in general, what they suggest is that a high-dose statin after sustaining a heart attack can decrease the inflammatory profile enough. And uh, so it's not just cholesterol, but the inflammatory profile to stabilize that inner lining of the vessels called the endothelium. Mm -hmm. That endothelium is so key important. It's like Superman's superpowers, right? It's like the the Teflon on a Teflon pan. It it prevents it's it prevents things from attacking. It's impermeable. It prevents that permeability into the artery and the attack and the formation of of the the placking and so forth. So that's one aspect. The other thing that originates from older studies is a class of medications called beta blockers. Mm -hmm. And these beta blockers slow your heart rate down, decrease the work of the heart, and and it was found that they can help prevent sudden death. And so this was a trial that was early on in the 80s and 90s and so forth. And so it stuck with us in terms of our recommendations. And that tends to be for roughly about a year or so for sure that we like patients between a year and one year to be on it if tolerant. Then there's a class of medications called ACE inhibitors, and those also stabilize the lining of the vessel, can lower the blood pressure. They also are good if a patient's heart isn't pumping as well. And so depending upon your risk factors will be if we strongly recommend it or if it's kind of negotiable. Then you look at things like aspirin, and I go back to my analogy of that frying pan, that Teflon pan. And so back before you all became saved and delivered from, from eating any and everything and you were cooking your eggs with cheese on it, you might have to, you know, that nonstick skillet, well, you could right, flip it up and there's not much of an issue. But let that nonstick skillet get a little worn down. Mm-hmm. You have to spray a little bit of oil on it. You have to spray a little substance that would keep it from sticking. Well, that's what happens as your arteries now become damaged as they're now erode they have less placking on it it's like those not those skillets that have become worn and so that's where the low dose aspirin comes in place for that now if i add in a stent this wire mesh which is like chicken wire to prop the vessel open in the vessel that's occluded now that's like when you walk in a brand new building and the and the wall is exposed with insulation and you see the wiring there you brush up against it with your sweater on you stick to it Mm -hmm. you need the extra layer of coating to kind of prevent that stickiness from occurring. So until, because in your the arteries of your, your body, that exposure, like using the building analogy, once the plaster gets put on there in the paint, you can brush all you want up against that wall and you won't stick to it. So we have to wait for a period of time until your body builds its own natural uh, plastering Mm -hmm. back over that stent area there. And so then you're able to get off of one of the blood thinners Typically, it could be any varying name of 
Plavix, to Effient, to your listeners out there, in addition to the aspirin, the docs will probably still recommend a baby aspirin. And there's been a lot of, a lot of news lately about aspirin use. And that was primarily looking at those who have not had an event and where you're looking at what we call primary prevention, preventing you from ever having an event. So I know it's a lot of information right there that I kind of threw at your listeners and so forth as it relates to are these medications indefinitely. And I tell every patient, medications were made for man, not man for medication or woman, right? Mm -hmm. And so I make adjustments according to how you respond in your lifestyle Mm -hmm. because it's like an old school seesaw. As you increase your lifestyle, there's a good chance I can eliminate, maybe not all, but a good portion of your medications based off of your lifestyle, what your blood pressure numbers are, your cholesterol numbers are, um, and inflammatory markers. Thank you so much for that explanation. So basically it boils down to, it depends, and there's caveats, and it has to be individualized. But absolutely, really keeping an open mind, keeping hope and doing all you can with your lifestyle, your diet, then, you know, there's hope that maybe some people might be able to get off most, all, depending on their situation. Do you have any specific dietary hacks that you recommend to decrease cholesterol further than just your standard whole food plant-based diet using things like Brazil nuts or certain herbs, spices, things like that? Yeah, well, there was a great study that was done out of a Canadian-based study, portfolio diet, and looking at varying types of legumes. And so you're looking at certain beans and essentially fiber-rich foods. I tend to accentuate, once again, the the green leafy vegetables as a huge because of the dietary nitrates, the fiber that's going to help the transport and and removal of cholesterol. Um, I also accentuate, too, as well, the... um, the the some of the the beans in terms of like soy and lentils and various things like that those are extremely profound in in accomplishing a lot of the same factors there and those are some of the main things i try to get away from anything that's a refined carbohydrate as well that may have the tendency to be processed and moved over into triglycerides and will throw off your panel as well and so in that process of adopting this aggressive dietary approach that's going to feed your microbiome that that consortium of bacteria inside your your gut that lives symbiotically with you and it helps to lower the cholesterol values that way so those are the the two main focuses of what i hit patients with are the green leafy vegetables legumes primarily um, and marginally as it relates to to the nuts for purposes of of cholesterol lowering Beautiful. You're speaking my language. I'm a bean pusher, so I'm always trying to get people to eat more beans. I think that that's a great place to start with a lot of people just because they don't have any experience or familiarity. So just having them start to experiment with adding beans to the diet can be a great place. Okay, let's shift gears. And I love how you pointed out that desserts backwards is stressed. I had no clue. Was that on purpose? How did how did that happen? That's amazing. So let's <laughs> talk crazy, about right? one of your areas of passion, which is the impact of stress on health and particularly heart disease. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things that just really resonated with me with my patients is I see stress every day. I, I didn't think I was going into psychiatry or becoming a psychologist <laughs> as I went down this road. But I, I've seen it every single day in my practice when I speak to patients and you and you get beyond the facade of, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Okay, well, you're not fine because you're here seeing me. So let's get dig into what's going on with you. And you realize the level of stress is pervasive in our society with us as practitioners. We've seen it with the emotional fatigue going through the pandemic. We see it with individuals on a regular basis. And so as I looked at stress in its forms and started looking at the research, and the research showing definitive strong correlation between stress and chronic disease, that individuals, and here's the thing, stress is an individual thing. Uh, It's hard to define, and and I always go back to when I was inside of uh, training. You know, I did all those many years after graduating from med school of training, right? It's just seven years, but I remember my first year, they called the internship year, you know this, and, and I was talking with my sister after doing, before they had time constraints on sleeping and hours of work, about nearly 36 hours up straight. And she asked me if I took care of something for my my parents. I was like, listen, do you know what I do for a living? I said, I've been running around all night and I'm tired and stressed. And she said, you're not the only one stressed. I have a baby girl at home. 
if if something if I get if if something happens to her, I'm responsible. And I didn't push back. I didn't argue, but in that moment I realized that stress is so individual that my sister may have been perceiving more stress than I was perceiving. That the barista at Starbucks may be perceiving more stress than I perceive when I'm taking care of a patient with a heart attack. It's such an individual thing. And so this is what studies have shown. They've shown that perceived stress is uniquely and distinctly associated with almost every chronic disease. Diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, all of these variables that are there. And that the relationship is strong. That this manifestation. So it's not just a mental ailment, but the mind-body connection is powerful. And this really resonated with me of something that I learned after finishing training is that this thing called the broken heart. I love the heart as I started out, right? And I only thought of a broken heart as, you know, the time the young lady didn't say yes when I asked her out or reading about Romeo and Juliet. But the thing, there is something called the broken heart syndrome, mm -hmm. Takotsubo disorder. And I had no awareness of it because it was not described until 1990s or so. And so... At this point in time, I realized that broken heart is really this Russian surge of acute emotional stressor can cause the heart not to squeeze. The heart becomes paralyzed. The heart all of a sudden appears to have its, its heart failure. And it can give the same mimic appearance of a massive heart attack. And it more uh, uh, often affects women. It more often affects individuals in situations like that. And here's the thing. In 2020, there was a massive uptick in Takotsubo disorder, unrelated to the coronavirus, unrelated to any infectious etiology. And so researchers uh, suggest it's due to the stress, the growing levels of stress and anxiety inside of our world. That's why stress is important. That's why my focus in lecturing and talking revolves around stress, but not from stress from thinking that it's completely our enemy, but how we need to to lean into it. We need to turn. We need to change the tide and direction the way we perceive our world around us and take on components that can help us offset it. That's where that's what why it's important to talk about stress. Wow. The human body is incredibly fascinating. It's amazing yes. that we can create enough chemicals by our own thoughts that yes. we can cause our own heart to dysfunction. I mean Yes. crazy like we don't even need anything to be put into us for us to like just our own thoughts you know yeah which is why everybody read the four agreements and the fifth agreement <laughs> it might help you a little bit but <laughs> love that so, love that. So, I, I have to i have to check out the fifth agreement yeah. i do want to chime in with this is that you think of it right what we prescribe we prescribe medications as physicians and we've been trained that way and when we look at research for for medications it always revolves around the placebo yes and what is a placebo? A placebo means I want to fool the individual into thinking that they're taking something that has medicinal purposes when it's really neutral. It has no effect. So we're, we're saying, is the mind stronger than that pill, that pharmaceutical? Is the mind stronger? And we say that the pill is ineffective if the mind is stronger. If the pill is slightly the same as the mind or better, then we say, oh, the pill is extremely effective. So we're indirectly recognizing the power of the mind to influence disease states. But here's the even crazier part is that as physicians, if I tell someone that this therapy is going to not going to be effective for you, their studies have validated the fact that a person's manifestation, all of a sudden, it won't work as well for them. The no <laughs> Whether or not it's a skin ailment. <laughs> yes. Yes. So there is so much power in, t in the mind. It's, it's hugely power. Uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating subject. So what do you recommend for your patients? What skills and tools do you have them start adopting to combat this stress or to manage this stress or to manage their thoughts and feelings? Yeah. You know, I, it, this is a long answer, but I, I tend to, I've come up with what I call, um, this acronym of being selfish is really what I tell patients they have to do. They have to get selfish. And what do I mean by selfish? The S stands for spiritual. The E stands for exercise. The L stands for love. The F stands for food. The I stands for intimacy. The S stands for sleep rest, right? And the H stands for humor, laughter. 
And so when we dig into this a little bit more and we we dig into the concept of being selfish that we're often taught as kids, don't be selfish. Share with your brother and sister, right? We get that all the time. But the concept of selfish is that we need to get selfish in order to live the life of purpose that we need to. Because when we get spiritual, and I don't mean a specific religious orientation, but I mean taking time to reflect. I mean taking time for meditation. I mean, taking time to prayer to, to calm yourself from the fast pace of life that's there. Studies have shown that it strengthens the prefrontal cortex that helps our reasoning, our decision making, that it lowers the heart rate. It strengthens the endothelium, that lining of the vessel, and helps it to, di to dilate. And there's huge power in simply taking time to pause and allowing the mind to come to rest. Right. That, that's the first step. And so if we can start our day with that. That's why it's the beginning of the, the acronym. What's E exercise activity says are shown. There was just recently a study that came out that by 10 minute increments that we can substantially prolong our life. So as we move from just moving around, it doesn't take being a CrossFit expert, being a marathon runner. It just simply means we have to get neat with our exercise, non exercise activity thermogenesis. Walking around, standing and cooking, climbing stairs, vacuuming, gardening. That's what you call non-exercise activity thermogenesis, right? As we do that and we embrace the simple things, especially outdoor green exercise, it empowers us, both mind, body, and soul. And there's huge power, once again, on the heart and to heal a broken heart. Then we turn to love. Uh, there's so much hate. You turn on the news. I walk in the room with my mom who lives with me. I don't live with my mom. I want to get that clear. Right. She lives with me. <laughs> All right. I like, how you, for, I like just, how you made that clarification. <laughs> yeah. Just want to be transparent now. And so if my mom is watching the news, I just hear death and mayhem and hatred constantly. And our mind becomes filled with it. Mm -hmm. But when in turn we embrace love. And what do I mean by love? Uh, love is manifest. I'm going to break it down neurochemically into a release of a hormone like a mother and their child called oxytocin mm -hmm. between a couple that hugs. Right. And this thing called oxytocin is is really it's the antidote towards stress, whereas stress is the fight or flight run hormone. The oxytocin is a tend and befriend hormone that you come together. And so as a result of it, when it's released, it's been shown to be protective for the heart. It's been shown to have reparative functions on the cells of the heart. It's been shown to help dilate the vessels, right? That endothelium and help relax it. So there's power in choosing to love. It's a choice. It's an action in the word. It's a verb. Then F, we talked about food multiple times. We know about the power of food, of real food, whole food, plant-based foods, fiber-rich foods, foods that make you chew. <laughs> foods that are not pre-chew that will melt in your mouth, not in your hands. You want foods that make your, your teeth work, that make your jaws go up and down. That's where power lies in diversity of foods. Like the diversity of life is so important, right? That's what you want to embrace. Intimacy, not in a sexual way, but intimacy from a relationship standpoint. I always joke once again about my mom is that she'll say her best friend is her dog. And I'm like, really? Am I just that's it, right? <laughs> because they have an intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. Her dog understands if she's sad. Her dog understands if she's not feeling well. And so that that's an intimate relationship. And there's a power just in that alone that science has really demonstrated of our animals, right? That's there. And so whether or not it's a friend, whether or not it's a loved one, whether or not it's a, a relationship with someone that is important. Here's the catch. This social interaction is so strong, so powerful. Saves have shown that individuals who have strong social connections are less likely to succumb to the issues of, of stress. They're less likely to have infectious colds and things of that nature when you have a strong social support. There's power there. That's the, that's the eye of intimacy. The S of sleep. Sleep is the thing that we all think we don't need. Mm -hmm. uh, we spend a third of our life, or we should, in this sleep, this reparative, restorative time of our bodies to reset but yet we 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 shorten that time we ignore that time so we can allegedly be more productive when that productivity lies in getting our rest that productivity the health and that association that's been there once again with the lying of the vessels once again with our memory once again with our heart and so sleep is so important why seven to nine hours and that when you fall below that 
Studies have shown an increased risk of adverse events, once again affecting the heart. So this idea of selfish, of getting there, is so important when we get at laughter. A mirthful laugh is so powerful to the body. They've done research looking at even watching a movie that's crime riddled versus a movie that makes you laugh. That watching news versus watching something that makes you smile. That all of a sudden that your, bo your body is affected, your blood pressure is affected, your endothelium, that lining of the vessels is affected by what you choose to put into your body. And all of these things together in concert can play a role in your genetic expression called epigenes. Uh, so when we choose to get selfish, when we choose to get selfish, we're building the resources because stress also equals demands minus resources. Mm -hmm. So when we choose to get selfish, we're adding to our resources yes. that helps us offset the demands of life and lower our stress. But here's another equation for you. Because our health equals our resiliency divided by our, uh, excuse me, our, our stress divided by our resiliency, right? The higher our stress, the poorer our health. Right? Uh, 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 excuse me, I said the inverse. Resiliency divided by stress. We need to add to our resiliency so we can increase our stress. Mm -hmm. That resiliency is built on being selfish. Yes. So that's why I encourage my patients. You have to be selfish. There is no time to waste in getting selfish. Because when you're selfish, you're going to have more time for your kids. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to be around more. Uh, when you're selfish, you're going to be more productive at work because guess what? Your mind is going to be sharper. Your body's going to be there. You're going to have more presenteeism, right? Not just body present, but mind present. And so these things are extremely important. It's that quality that's built by being selfish. Wow, Dr. Batiste, this is brilliant. I got chills. Tears came to my eyes. What a beautiful acronym. I predict a best-selling book in your future. I'm hoping you definitely need to trademark this, stamp it with your name. It's, it's perfect, it's beautiful, it's brilliant, and it makes so much sense because we have taken that self-care, that taking care of ourselves and said, you know, it's not that important. I need to take care of everybody else, especially moms that listen to my podcast. They have several kids. They have a husband to take care of. They have careers. They, they're they giving to everything else except for themselves. But what you said so beautifully is that if we don't take care of ourselves, if we're not applying these principles of being selfish, we're going to cut our lives short or we're going to feel horrible the whole time we're trying to help other people. So in order to be better of service, which is a big motivator for a lot of my listeners, we do have to contribute to our own health, our own well-being, our self-care, and just have more joy on a day-to-day -day basis. And we can do that by following these steps. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it is. I mean, I wish I can originate, but the, it's, this is something that is a concept that's existed since the dawn of time. We just don't embrace it. Mm -hmm. We maybe haven't packaged it together in this way. Mm -hmm. But I think in this, our society right now, it's so needed. Yes. It's so needed. And it applies on many levels, whether or not it's education with our kids, whether or not it's productivity at work. All these aspects and the, the tangents off of being selfish it applies mm -hmm. to men, to women, to boys and girls is the same. Yes. Wow. Well, let's switch gears again yeah. to a little bit of a tougher topic to discuss, and that's discrimination. I know that this yeah. is also something that you're very passionate about talking about, and you've even helped co-found nonprofits. So tell me, how does discrimination impact health, and what are we missing here that we're not talking about enough? I'll tell you. Discrimination, it's, it's, it's a thing we, none of us want to talk about. And here's my perfect analogy. Back in the 1960s, I forget the Supreme Court justice that, who said this, is they said pornography. It's hard to define, but you know it when you see it, right? It's something that you, it's a feeling. It's a sense that you have. It's a look. And so there's been a tremendous amount of work that's been done inside of it. And so obviously we all live in our own skin and we come at things from our own vantage point in our life's experiences. And so being an African-American man growing up inside the inner city, um, I've grown and I've, I've lived a very blessed life, to be honest with you, despite some, despite how I, I, the intro to that, very blessed, very privileged in the sense of two family home, 
parents who sacrifice everything for me to achieve. Um, and that's not the case for everyone of any of, of varying ethnic groups and so forth. And so I'm very privileged, but I recognize the fact that I'm still subject to some of these things. And I'll tell you, something just happened just recently to me that I brought a loved one all of a sudden told me as an interventional cardiologist, hey, Columbus, I've been having chest pain. They called me and said that they were having chest pain. They said, where are the symptoms for a heart attack? I think I'm having a heart attack. I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. They then go in, they describe how six hours before going for a walk, they started developing chest tightness going down their arm, mm -hmm. female, right? 50 years of age. And then, and then describing that it was persistent, but not horrible, some shortness of breath. They decide to go ahead and take two uh, aspirin, and then they drive to, to, to take someone to a restaurant. And when they parked, that's when they called me. I immediately told them, you need to call 911. They didn't want to. They minimized the symptoms. They finally decided to go ahead and call 911. By the time I got there to check on them, they had sent the ambulance off and said, I just felt embarrassed. So I personally drove them to the hospital. Drove them to the hospital myself, a hospital that I've worked at that I perform procedures on. I take them there and I tell the intake nurse about the symptoms that this individual is having and describe them uniquely. Then I step back and as I watch, next thing I knew is that they were not being very proactive in bringing that individual back. But I watched and so they did what they did. And next thing I know, I get a call saying, that they said, hey, what are you doing? I said, what are you doing? And they said, we're just sitting in the lobby. You're sitting in the lobby and i overheard the nurse say you don't look very short of breath are you really having shortness of breath needless to say this individual was not treated promptly now in my mind i begin to wonder i've treated thousands of patients i've seen hundreds of patients inside the er specifically um, typically they come up and i meet them in the cath lab but they typically are rushed back when there's any suspicion of the heart involved and I said, why was there this decreased attention in the ER that was not very busy in a hospital I, I frequent and I, I know? And all I could think of was gender, because we know that women are taken less seriously than men when it comes to heart issues. We know that African Americans and people of persons of color are taken less seriously and are less likely to receive timely care. They're less likely to be admitted when a diagnosis is made. They're less likely to receive invasive procedures when they're readily available. They're less, less likely to be referred to a specialist, less likely to receive transplants, defibrillators, valve replacements, less likely to receive life sparing uh, blood thinners when needed. And so all my mind could go to in this particular situation was, was there a lack of attention, whether it was subconscious and what we characterize as implicit bias or was it something that was overt now i can't state that i can only tell you what the feeling was mm -hmm. as a provider and so this example of something that transpired within this past month it reflects why this is an important topic mm -hmm. it reflects why i put passion into this this reflects why it's so important to bring awareness and to empower people to become their own advocate for their health and wellness on a daily basis, but also when they seek out medical care. That it's important to provide education to my colleagues and to myself that I must recognize my own biases that I may have. I, I always joke and to, to lighten things up a little bit, I always have one of my biases is that I think everyone from England is extremely smart. When I start to hear them speak, I think, <laughs> man, they must be intelligent. Is this, are they related to the king or queen of England? And that's a bias, right? But the, the negative biases are problematic. And I'll, I'll give you a, a, a juxtaposed description of my own bias. I remember one time being busy. You know, I'm still practicing fully. At that time, I was chief of cardiology. I'm no longer chief of cardiology. I stepped down in 2020. I have some other administrative roles. And so I remember rushing between meetings, had a full double book clinic. And my last patient was a consult. I walked in the room. It was a disheveled appearing Caucasian male. Smelled of cigarette smoke. Nail beds were dirty, grimy. I had reviewed the records briefly and saw that he had a lot of suggestion of bad coronary disease 
without it being diagnosed and that he was likely going to need um, a, a procedure. And he had an issue with his heart valve that I felt it's probably going to end up being bypass surgery. In the worst version of myself possible, I walked into the room, started speaking with him fairly quickly, did not allow much time for him to communicate with me, told him kindly, succinctly, matter of factly, that what he needed to do was that he's going to have to have an invasive procedure that would likely lead to open heart surgery and a recovery that would be a little bit prolonged given his smoking history. He looked up at me as I'm just rolling like I'm memorizing this statement recital. And he said, is there anything else I could do, Doc? I paused for a second. Now you would think that would be enough to kind of get me going the right track. Nah, I'm hard-headed. Got a big <laughs> head. Hard-headed. Right? I'm like, yeah, there's something you could do. You can go whole food, plant-based, no oil, no salt, no sugar, all vegetables and beans, and da da I didn't try and roll out the smart goals I told you before earlier. I, I didn't tell them one bite at a time. I didn't tell them we're going to try one thing. I was very arrogant in that moment. A bit condescending, a, get, a bit presumptuous in my approach. He looked at me and he said, okay. He said, okay. Now that second knock on the head was enough for me to stop. And I apologized to him in that moment. And we stopped and we had a long conversation. And I will never, ever, ever forget that interaction with that patient many years ago. I never forget that interaction of how he looked and how I felt inside humiliated at the way I treated him as a being, as a human being, as a person who needed care and concern in that moment. And I was too concerned about my own self. I was being selfish in the bad sense, not selfish in the good sense. Right. And so that bias that I made on him, because would I have responded had he come in professionally dressed? Mm -hmm. Would I have responded if his nail beds were not dirty and he didn't smell of smoke? Would I have responded the same way if I knew he carried a title? Would I have responded that way if I knew he was connected to someone, a family member, whatever else, someone that I know? Why was I preferentially biased against towards him in that moment? And so bias exists in all of us. Yes. And so when I speak of bias, I don't mean it from a judgmental standpoint of any person, but we have to recognize the fact that we are flawed humans. But as healthcare providers, we're held to a higher standard. Uh, we have a higher burden of responsibility because we're caring for an individual's life that can affect their, their family and the community. And that's why I speak on discrimination. That's why I speak on bias. That's why I work feverishly to educate the community about what they can do on their own and awareness of their rights, their inalienable rights, a life, liberty, and the pursuit of health and wellness, yes. right? That's the goal. Everyone should have the ability to live in a, a community, in an environment that affords them the rights that they can live healthfully and not be subjugated towards food deserts and food swamps and not be subjugated towards assistance programs that don't promote healthful living, that not be subjugated towards a system that doesn't allow them to go on public transportation with multiple bags with groceries, to not be subjugated that the only thing that appears to be affordable are the foods that are putting them in the grave. Mm -hmm. That's why it's important because as Muhammad Ali said, <laughs> our price for living on this earth is a service we give. And I've been very blessed, right? And so we have, each and every one of us have a huge service that we're responsible at paying the rent for yes. our time on this earth. Mm. That's the goal. Wow. Dr. Batiste, thank you so much for your humility and your transparency for sharing that story. I think that sometimes we do assume that there's people that are just out there being evil and just being bad people and then there's like the perfect people right but no we mm -hmm. all have bias and it is becoming aware of those biases but you're right it's not just about educating the healthcare community to try to tune into these biases that we have but also access their empathy and compassion with each 
patient experience, which can be hard at the end of the day, you know, when you're tired and you're worn out and you're, you're just done with all of it, right? So <laughs> it takes so much energy to keep tapping into that empathy and compassion, but it's also about educating patients, just like you said, that they're aware that we all have our biases and what they can do to try to obtain the health care that they deserve, the rights that they deserve as a patient. And there's just so much to do. There's so much work to do, so many levels. And I, I really appreciate that you are doing this work and that you're passionate about this subject because it's going to take a lot of us working together to slowly improve it. So thank you so much for sharing about that. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Slave Food Project? Yeah, so Slave Food Project is just exactly what we've talked about today. It's this confluence of looking at that partner with a colleague and friend, Eric Walsh, and under the auspices of the nonprofit. And what we're doing is we're working on educating people about the role of stress, discrimination, and either way of looking at it, either the weaponization of food or nutritional stress, as I like to characterize it, mm -hmm. and their role in creating disparities and health disparities that attack communities at risk. These are many times as communities of color, but if we look a little bit more wider lens, we understand that in the United States itself, that we pale in comparison to other industrialized countries in terms of our health outcomes, mm -hmm. despite our technology, despite the wonderful minds that exist inside of our country. Our health outcomes are poor. And so with, there's a disparity between our outcomes and those of other industrialized countries. And that's really what slave food is about. It's a double entendre. It's saying that, you know, that you have some individuals who are almost enslaved by the addictive nature of, of food <laughs> around them. That you have some individuals that are enslaved by their communities that appear not to have a way, a way out. That are a maze filled with these, these landmines of, of fast food restaurants and liquor stores um, and without resources of health promoting foods or walkways or green areas. And so essentially you're living in this enslaved environment. So it is a double entendre that also reflects back on the journey of many inside the African American community through the diaspora as well. So it's a mixture targeted, but the message uh, falls through to everyone. I, I, I'll take a few more moments and tell you, I, I gave a very a lecture on the slave food um, by myself to a Canadian company. And it was their black um, uh, ERG or their their resource group. And so they had a couple of people of different uh, ethnic backgrounds on there. And I'll tell you, uh, everyone, it was a Caucasian man from Georgia who reached out to me who was one of the IAB execs. So we started communicating. And I'm always happy to help folks out as best I can and working together. And I'll tell you, he lost 40 pounds. He is feeling living his best life. And he is so appreciative. Of, of all things, slave food. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So it's a message that is, is, pertains to all of us. Wow. So impactful, so important. Thank you so much. One final question before we disseminate information about how listeners can connect with you. But what do you wish more people knew? Hmm. I think that they deserve it. You deserve a better life. Right. And that, you know, it's just you have to you have to avoid the noise, ignore the noise and you have to live your your best life. And what that means is to truly live your best life. We talked about already. It's being selfish, but you are worth it. You're worth it. You're worth the time to invest in you. You're worth the time to invest in your health future. You're worth it. And so that value is so important. I say oftentimes, we say this in our lectures, that resources go where value is placed. Resources go where value is placed. Where are your resources going? Mm -hmm. If they're not going to you, that means you don't value you. I want people to know that you are worth being valued. Place your resources where they deserve to be placed in you so you can live a life of purpose. That's the goal. Oh, my goodness. That is so perfectly said. Thank you so much, Dr. Batiste. I love your heart. You're dynamic. You're brilliant. I know my listeners have fallen in love with you as well. So please tell us where we can connect with you, how we can learn more about the Slave Food Project and other things that you're involved with. 
Yes, yes. No, but I appreciate this time so much. And I'm working on that aspect of social media and everything else. I'm, I, I, it, it is a flaw within me in terms of my, my <laughs> connectivity with there. But I'm at, at Healthy Heart Doc on Instagram and on Facebook, um, too, as well. We also have the Slave Food Project on YouTube where you can watch past shows and future shows, too, as well. Um, encourage your listeners out there, go and subscribe to it. If you want to check out some of the work that's happening, um, I start a nonprofit, but I'm not leading. I would decide I'll take a step back so it doesn't have the appearance of conflict of interest. When I speak, I give honorariums to the organization, but it's called Healthy Heart Nation, and it's my HHN dot org and it, the the goal is to really educate and empower the community as it relates to business health justice and uh and 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 uh, and all those areas there so it's it's a powerful and education excuse me and those are really the components that comprise social determinants of health that really have the potential to impact the future of many communities at risk awesome so amazing you're doing wonderful work don't apologize for not being on social media. I'm telling you, it is a time suck. And you are doing <laughs> such important work, like literally saving people's lives and stuff like that. So <laughs> that's kind of important. So thank you for, for putting your time there and for educating us and inspiring us. Like I said, this was just so powerful. So I appreciate your time. I know it's so limited. Thank you so much for everything you do. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. Appreciate you. Thank you again. Wow, wow, wow. What an amazing conversation. Dr. Batiste is amazing. He blew me away. He is so dynamic. He's passionate. He obviously cares so much about his patients. He's humble. I just love what he said. That selfish mnemonic spiritual, exercise, love, food, intimacy, sleep, and humor. Those are all so important. It overlaps beautifully with the principles of lifestyle medicine. And he knows because he's a cardiologist, he deals with the heart. So he's seeing how these factors, not just what we eat, not just how we move, but our stress in our lives, how they impact our health, how they impact our heart. And Talking about discrimination, you know, there's so many different ways that we may face discrimination. And something that I'm particularly passionate about is size discrimination. So that's something that I want to talk more about in coming episodes, with, which is this medical bias we have, this implicit bias we have when it comes to body size, larger bodies. So so important all of this information i really hope that you enjoyed it as much as i did i was tearing up i i just couldn't believe the story that he told and how it connected so much to my heart as a physician as a human and i hope that it really touched you as well and that you learned some information today that you can begin to apply to your own life thank you so much for hanging in there with us i hope that you have a very plantastic day Hey, veggie lover, I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.